I'm here at the World Creators Summit with uh, Tom Fredericks, who is partner at the uh, London law firm Clinton's, uh, a law firm that works specifically on digital media and interactive content. Uh, so, uh, hi, and uh, thanks for coming on. How's it going today? Yeah, very well. Well, it's great to have you on. And so, first of all, I wanted to talk about you know the startup community. This is something that on Digital Music Trends I've been covering for years now, and uh, I think the perception of music startups has, has changed over the years, the way they operate and, and how organized they are as well. Uh, do you feel like they have a better idea now of the rights they require for music or is there still a lot of confusion and a lot of clarifications and education that needs to be done? Uh, well, both answers really. It has gotten better than it used to be. Um, I think a lot of startups are aware of the, um, the basics. They understand that PRS exists, they understand that GAMA exists, they know a bit about the US. Uh, in terms of, of ASCAP and BMI, um, but it's, it, it's, um, they never really achieved the detailed understanding of um, the other societies in Europe. And what's worse is in the last two or three years, as startups have started to understand what's going on, the system itself has changed. So they're not able to keep up. Who is? It's so tough. Uh, and now we have a new initiative for direct licensing coming from the, the four major publishers uh, and from a few other very big players like Cobalt. Uh, and that's going to be a real challenge for startups to figure out how to navigate what they still have to do from the old world, PRS, GEMA, ASCAP, BMI, all around the world, all the societies, but now also the direct licenses. And they need to figure out how the puzzle fits together because obviously they don't want to be paying more than they have to pay. Uh, and that's a possibility if they um, take licenses from all these different uh, organizations and fail to see where the overlaps might occur. So yeah. it is a confusing landscape. Startups have gotten better than they were in terms of understanding the basics of what's trying to be achieved. And I think they step up to the plate to try to address the issue more than they used to before, but it's a changing landscape and it's a challenge for anybody to keep up. Yeah, sure. And talking about direct licenses, uh, you know, what changes and, and how, you know, how can that benefit the publishers, for example, by implementing this type of new licensing? Yeah. Well, direct licensing is a reaction by the major rights holders, the four main publishers um, mainly, uh, to the statutory rates or the published rates that have come from the collecting societies. So the PRS had a published rate that we could see in their old licenses um, that lasted for a few years. Uh, same in the US, ASCAP and BMI had their published rates that lasted for a few years. And the direct licensers thought, uh, the major publishers thought, we can get more out of this ourselves because we're not subject to the same restrictions and limitations that the PRS and, the, and ASCAP and so forth are. So what we'll do is remove our rights from that blanket, do those licenses directly, negotiate very strongly because we're not restricted by anything. And once we've pushed that rate up a bit, uh, then um, the CMO can then take advantage of the market rate being higher and everybody wins. That's the thought. But the practical effect is we do less licenses. So there are just fewer licenses happening everywhere than the, because, as I said before, it becomes incredibly difficult for services to understand who they have to license from, to then negotiate with all these different licensors all the time, and then to watch the rates going up. And we all know that startups are already quite pressed, particularly in the early days, with very, very little margin. Uh, and it's, it's, um, uh, it ends up, I think, being an own goal for the licensors. Yeah. And uh, talking about uh, one of the issues that is, is hotly debated both in the, in the US and in, in Europe uh, around orphan works. Uh, in Europe, there, there, there has been a new sort of uh, some new measures that have been passed recently, uh, but they don't go all the way. You know, there are still some gaps left, left in there. But I, I probably sh should better leave it to you to explain sort of what was changed in Europe for orphan works and what are the gaps still left in there? Yeah, well, the idea of orphan works is that there are some songs or photographs or images or any sort of IP. Um, that a person might want to use on their website and they cannot find the person that owns it in order to get a license from it. And that's the orphan idea that we don't know where the parents are. Um, oddly, this is not a result of the startup space. This is mainly a result of the library space. The two libraries that, that really control the world in this area are the British Library and the US Library of Congress, which between the two of them have huge collections of historical works that they have no idea who they belong to. Uh, and they have been asking governments for a very long time, give us the ability to use these works and put them on display for the public um, when we cannot find the owners. And government has finally stepped up and said to the libraries, so long as you 
use some sort of reasonable effort to find the rights holder. If you cannot find them in a certain amount of time, then we'll allow you to use the works without a license, so long as you put a bit of money along to the side so that if we ever do find the owner, then we can pay them. Well, the worry is that now that this has been passed in the UK, it will be abused by people all over the world who figure, all I have to do is spend a few minutes looking for the owner. I won't find the owner because it's very hard to find owners if you don't know how where to look. And then I'm allowed to use it for free, aren't I? Yeah. So there's quite a big worry that this Orphan Works might end up being uh, a sort of license to use with for nothing on a lot of works. Um, I would say to users, be very careful because we don't know what the definition of a reasonable search for the, the owner is. Um, and uh, if you cannot show a paper trail that you searched long and hard, then it might be that you are seen as an infringer. So it almost feels like w what you're waiting for is for a case to come up where such a, an instance is tried and then the ruling would better define what, what the what the law says right now? So there will be a precedent of some sort? No doubt, that's what it is. Yeah, there's going to have to be some um, flesh on the bones of this very bare bones law so that we understand what a reasonable search actually is, because none of us know. Uh, I, I fear that it's going to be a much harder search than people think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, looking at uh, the provisions in the in Europe and in the US. In Europe it's called uh, Mere Conduit and in the US it's called Safe Harbor and it's attached to the DMCA, uh, which is hated by many in the, in the <laughs> copyright industries. Uh, and uh, so uh, those two uh, you know, ways of preventing copyrighted content from being uh, uh, available on, on user-generated uh, content sites it has been criticized a lot over, over the last uh, three, four years and the RIAA is sending millions of takedown requests a week uh, but it doesn't seem to be, to, it's like a, a, you know, a, a drop in the ocean and it's not making much of an effect really. Uh, so do you think that uh, those two provisions are likely to be revised at some point and is there a better way to uh, implement, you know, some sort of control over user-generated sites other than these? Other than these. Well, it's a great question and perhaps the most important question for the content industry these days. Um, the so-called safe harbor is a part of the US's DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act from a few years ago. Uh, the same analogous thing exists in Europe called the mere conduit exception, and they're both defenses to infringement. So a site like YouTube has users uploading content in huge numbers, of which a fair portion of it has not been licensed because users don't know where to get the license and don't even know about the scheme. And YouTube would normally be in the frame for being sued for this type of thing because that is infringing content on their site. They have a immunity, you might call it, from um, liability. They're able to get away with this and win any court case against them because they are afforded this immunity. It's not a new idea. It actually started about uh, 100 years ago when um, the phone companies were first laying cables under the earth in the, in the US and Europe, and they were worried that any crime that happened on those cables would be the phone company's fault. So the legislators said, yeah, we, we'll give you an immunity from that so long as you don't know what's going on on the phone. And that's true today. If you get a crank call on the phone um, and you come and uh, it's, it's harmful to you, the phone company is not the one who will go to jail because they didn't know about it. But if you phone them up and say, excuse me, I'm getting um, these sort of crank phone calls, I don't want them anymore, here's the number I'm getting from, uh, getting them from, the company has to act on that and stop it. And if they don't, then they will be as good as the one making the calls. But if they don't know what's going on, they have immunity. So that's the story today. You, YouTube and Google and uh, um, those are the two biggest, but many other of these UGC websites have immunity and a defense from all this infringement. And you have to tell them if there's an infringement going on. Now, I think when this was first brought into um, existence in uh, 1998 and, and 2002 in Europe, the legislators figured it would be just like the phone companies, where there would be a few notices every now and then about crank calls. I don't think that they foresaw that there would be upwards of two million a week coming from even a single organization. Two Two million a week from companies like um, the, the record industry uh, body, BPI. And obviously that's an unbelievable burden on them. Two million a week is a more than a full-time job. And um, that
that puts more than the burden of notice on them. It puts basically the entire burden of controlling infringement on them. I don't know how to rebalance this, but it's clear that it does need rebalancing. Uh, and the forces on each side, tech and content, are lining up for the new version of Safe Harbor and, and Mere Conduit that's coming. Um, and that is going to be a bitter fight to see how it's perhaps quite subtly changed, but changed in some way so that we can get rid of the main problem going on today, and that is the far, far too heavy burden of issuing these takedown notices. There's just too many required. Uh, and then, of course, I, I do have to say that not only there are huge numbers, but as soon as you issue a takedown notice, even if the company um, complies very quickly, in many cases it's put back up by somebody else within an hour. Yeah. And that's just an, not only a massive burden, but a constant burden every minute of every day for all time. Yeah. And that is an untenable position. Um, I understand the, the content position. Uh, I understand also the, the um, tech position that they obviously need to be a communication service, but the balance needs shifting. And that's going to be the big argument over the next year or so. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I just want to finish by uh, asking you about uh, societies. So, uh, CISAC, of course, uh, is an organization that that represents uh, and and brings together all the all the different uh, uh, you know content creators and, and co copyright holders uh, in in the world. And uh, but Ross Simon in in the previous session was uh, actually asked a question about uh, why there isn't uh, a more sort of uh, focused uh, forum for uh, societies to actually meet up and discuss some of the, the more pressing issues. And one of the things that came to my mind was uh, talk, uh, thinking about the Global Repertoire Database, which is uh, perhaps the, the one initiative that is attempting to bring all the different societies together and, and work together to, f to create this, uh, this fantastic new database that hopefully will, will happen. So what is your take on, on the GRD and, and are you optimistic about, about its, uh, its uh, chance of, of becoming that, that resource? I am optimistic about it. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, I think you asked two questions, though. Yeah. Um, uh, Ralph Simon mentioned before a, a possible umbrella body that pulls together all the collection societies or perhaps even rights holders to speak with one voice, and um, that's a possibility. It might not be a bad idea, but one has to be very careful about that because it could be seen as just a lobbying block that's very powerful, uh, and certainly there'll be some people who say that that's unfair. Yeah. Um, as for the GRD, though, um, I think it's impossible for anybody to be opposed to it. It's just the most obvious thing in the world. We all have to have some kind of database that shows all the works. Uh, the questions are, who's going to pay for it? Um, uh, I don't think there's such a worry about who's going to own it or find it, because we've never seen a database in history that's managed to be kept secret. Yeah. It will be made public somehow, even if it's by file sharing, somehow it will get out to the world. So I, I'm not concerned really about control of the database. We have to be concerned about who's going to pay for it, because it's, it's certainly going to be hundreds of millions. Uh, but the worst part is that it's not an IT issue that's in our way. The IT is easy. Well, I shouldn't say easy, but it's, it's relatively um, not a challenge, because we live in a world today where you know, we can do pretty much anything. Um, so the, the IT challenge will be overcome relatively quickly, perhaps in a year or two years. And then all of the world's songs will be shoved together in one database. And in a sense, you'll already have the GRD, but it will be incredibly messy. There will be mistakes, there'll be conflicts, there'll be missing data, there'll be misspellings, a huge amount of problems built up over a hundred years, and that can only be cleaned song by song, you might say with a toothbrush. And that's a very long process. It does require that each one is looked at and scrubbed very, very carefully um, and um, slowly to make sure it's done correctly, and uh, that's going to take a long time. I would have thought it could be quite a few years before the thing gets to a level of cleanliness that it's useful to rights holders and content uh, and content users. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Tom, and I hope you have a great uh, rest of the event. Thank you. Pleasure.